So this is a full guide for the progressive repertoire for the double bass, volume one by George Vance. Uh, throughout this guide, I'm going to give you a couple tricks and tips and things to watch out for in each exercise, followed by a demonstration of every exercise in the book. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments. Thanks for watching. To find the third position, place your thumb on the neck block and then put down your first finger over the harmonic A on the D string. Then play the next three exercises. quite short. This is called the Martelet bow stroke. Each note should have a clear beginning and a clear end. Watch out for the possible intonation trouble you could run into crossing from the E to the B. with the tuner to get this more consistent. it's important to keep your wrist loose. It's very easy to build up tension when you're playing fast notes. For variation one, play the 16th notes long and the 8th notes short. For variation two, make sure you have the metronome going while you practice and follow the bowing. For variation three, again, keep a loose wrist, and you might want to work this one up from slow tempo. For variation four, it's important to sing the rhythm out before you actually play it so that you hear the right subdivision in your head. It can also help to add a little emphasis on the beginning of each of those groups of three. For variation 5, again, just maintain a loose wrist. For measure 29 and 30, those double slashes through the quarter notes just means to continue playing 16th notes. In the theme, make sure you're playing the quarter notes short and make sure you're playing the half notes long. You have tenuto markings over those, which means to maintain the sound through the whole value of the note.
Before beginning Scotland's Burning, make sure you find your third position again with use of your harmonics. And you'll want to pay careful attention to the intonation in measure 7, the octave leap. If it's out of tune, it'll really stick out. As opposed to... make sure your E in third position matches your E in first position. You'll want to practice this a couple times to gain the consistency of that shift. For the second prep, the F sharp harmonic should match the closed F sharp. If it doesn't, that means you're out of position and you need to adjust your hand shape. at the bottom of this page. I actually think that this is backwards in the book. I think it makes more sense to work on the theme first and then come back to the bowing variations. But either way, just make sure that you're maintaining a loose wrist and use your metronome the same way that you had to do in Shorten and Bread. <laughs> for the theme in the beginning of page 14. Play through these first four measures while saying the words short, short, and long to help you internalize the bow distribution. The second prep is a similar exercise. We practice the bow distribution on just one note on the harmonic. Short, 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 short. twinkle theme make sure you're following the bow distribution that you practiced before also make sure you're playing all these notes nice and long as if you were singing <laughs>
Wilkins Burning on page 16, we have our introduction to fourth position. Fourth position is also known as thumb position. In fourth position, we bring our thumb from the back of the neck up onto the fingerboard. And the thumb rests on the octave harmonic of the G string and the D string. When playing in fourth position, our bow has to move closer to the bridge to get the optimum sound and prevent squeaking. Remember that as we move up the fingerboard, the notes keep getting closer and closer and closer together. So the notes here are going to be closer than they were here, which are even closer than the notes here. In measure five on the octave D harmonics, it's important that we expand the hand to reach both notes. We shouldn't have to shift in between these notes. You can touch both harmonics at the same time as if they were a double stop. For the lightly row preparation, play through the exercise while saying short, short, long to help internalize the bow distribution, just as we did with Twinkle Twinkle. Short, short, long, short, short, long, short, 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 long. When playing through the theme of lightly row, make sure that you keep your bow distribution in mind, and also play this one quite long. Another thing to start to practice is to have your fingers down ahead of time in the left hand before you need them in the right hand. So before you begin this one, have the A and the F sharp already down and ready to go and hold those notes down like a double stop. This helps to get rid of extra movement that we don't need in the left hand. Tell me which one looks more efficient. Or This can also be done in measure two. Have the E down ahead of time while you're playing the open G. It can also be done in measure 9. Have the A down ahead of time while playing the F sharp and D. This is something that gets more and more important as the music gets faster and faster. position, the fingering is very similar to what it was in the first position. Instead of playing open D and open G, those are replaced with thumb harmonic D and thumb harmonic G. The first finger on the A and the E remain the same. And all of the fourth finger Bs and F sharp turn into third fingers. Remember the rules of bow distribution still apply, and to play closer to the bridge.
in Rachel, we have our first set of shifts. At the end of measure six, we have a rest. During that time, we have to shift. It's important to shift during this rest so that our hand is ready to go by the time we have to start playing again. Shift. It's also a good idea to have that F sharp ready to go while you're playing the open Gs. In measure 10, we have another shift back up to third position. It's important to take advantage of the time given by the rest in the open strings. Rest. and goose are played very similar to the first exercise we played, shorten and bread. They're played with a martelay stroke and very short. We have another shift in this one. We have to do it faster in measure seven. During the open G is our time to shift. This is one that you're going to want to practice slowly at first so you get the movement. retake peppered throughout this one and the previous one. In this instance, all retake means is to go back to the frog to prepare for another down bow. Retake. At the end of this one, we have a message that says fox and goose can also be played pizzicato. I've included a demonstration of that as well. Preparation for Go Tell Aunt Rhody allows us to practice the rhythm <clears throat> and bow distribution on just one harmonic. In Go Tell Aunt Rhody, we have three different dynamic markings. We start at so forte, which means medium volume. We go to forte, which means loud volume. And we go to piano, which means soft volume. Make sure you make a difference. Remember, we change our dynamic through three bow factors. Those factors are the speed of the bow, how fast the bow moves this way, the placement of the bow, where the bow is in relationship to the bridge and the fingerboard, and the weight of the bow, or the pressure, how much force is pushing down on the string. You should experiment with all three of these factors to explore your dynamic range. In the last measure of this one, we have a poco rip, which just means a little slowdown. <laughs> Thank uh -huh.
position follows the same rules as Twinkle Twinkle in fourth position did. All the open strings are replaced with thumb harmonics. And all of the fourth fingers are now replaced with third fingers. Also similar to lightly row in first position, make sure you practice having your fingers down before you need them. So practice holding down A and F sharp as a double stop. As well as G and E as a double stop. is much the same as the previous examples. The fingering rules remain the same and try to have your fingers down ahead of time before you need them. There's also another poco writ at the end of this one so pay attention to that. strokes. We have the martelet bow stroke, very short quarter notes. We have decache eighth notes, which means that they're played a little longer, but there's still a little space in between them. And then we have the tenuto dotted half notes, which means we hold them for the full value. Make sure you really make a difference in all these articulations. When we move up into fourth position and play the melody an octave higher, don't forget that our bow has to move closer to the bridge. And even though we want to keep these quarter notes short in fourth position as well, if we use too little bow here, we don't get a very good sound. So even for the shorter quarter notes, we need to use a little more bow because of the shorter string length.
formulation for go away old man is quite simple. It's just showing us that these three notes that we previously learned in first position, G, A, B, it's also possible to play in third position. This one also has a variety of articulations. Make sure that you observe them. We have a retake in measure eight before the eighth notes. It's okay to cut that half note a little bit short so that you get to the eighth notes in time. What's most important is that the measure stays in time. One, two. The same thing applies in measure 16. We also have a crescendo in measure 13, and this just means to get louder through those three notes. Shafto is just the first phrase of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star again, but in a new key. Instead of playing it in D major, we're now playing it in A major. And this means that we're playing it on the A string and the D string. Throughout Bobby Shafto, there's a lot of string crossings. It's a good idea to practice this one slowly with your metronome to get these nice and clean. We also have a retake two before the end. Don't be afraid to cut that quarter note a little bit short so that you start the next measure on time. children has a new rhythm we haven't seen yet, the pickup eighth note on the end of two. This happens a couple times throughout. I would recommend singing this one through before playing it to make sure that your rhythm is right. This is another good one to practice your double stops on. There's several times where we have to cross back and forth between F sharp and A, so it's much easier if you hold both the notes down at the same time. Same thing with the E and G. The last four measures of this one can be pretty tricky. I find it really easy to lose track of the A when I go up for that D harmonic. You have to lift the thumb up off the G, but you don't want to lift it so high that you lose track of where it is. So it might be helpful to just practice A, D, A, D, until you get used to going back and forth between those. dance we have several shifts to all the various positions we've learned so far. When shifting from fourth position down into third position, allow the neck block to guide you to help you find your note. When shifting from third position back into fourth position, allow the G harmonic to guide you. Towards the end of the piece we have the largest shift we've seen yet. We leap an entire octave on one string. We go from fourth position, G, A, B, to first position. Make sure you pay careful attention to your finger spacing. There is a large difference between the finger spacing here and here. And because it's in an octave, it'll be very easy to tell if it's out of tune. It really, really, really sticks out. We have a new articulation in measure 25 and 26. These are accents. You can think of it as a punch at the beginning of each of these notes. For the very last note of the piece, we have to go up into fifth position. To find fifth position, we first go to fourth position, 
and we play our G with our thumb, then we play the D above it with our third finger. Now we move our thumb to where our third finger was, and now we're in fifth position. To find that high G, we then place our third finger down. for ab sheed just shows us that the dot over the quarter note is played the same way as an eighth note with the rest. So in other words, short. This happens all throughout the piece. Throughout this one, we have a couple retakes with the bow, so watch out for that. We also have the accents again, so make sure you really punch those notes. In measure 21, we have a rit or retardando, which just means slow, slow down. And it's a slightly bigger slow down than the ones that we've seen before with the poco rit. We also have a new symbol just after this, which is a fermata. If we were playing in an orchestra right now, that fermata would mean hold the note and look at the conductor. And the conductor would tell you when to cut off and when to start again. Since you're just playing by yourself, it just means hold the note longer than the given value, stop, and then resume. We also have an odd tempo right next to that, which just means return to the previous tempo, which is the tempo at the beginning of the piece. we are introduced to the second position. The second position is found by first going into third position and finding the D harmonic on the G string, and then moving back so that our fourth finger is at the same spot that our first finger just was, which means the D should be underneath our fourth finger. This position is also called the tuning position because this is how we tune our instruments. Throughout this one, it's going to be important to practice the shift back and forth between first position and second position. The best way to do that in this piece is to practice your C sharp down to your B, and your B back up to your C sharp. We also have a couple new terms in this one. The dim in measure 22 is a diminuendo, which just is another way of saying quiet down or decrescendo. Then we have a rollentando, which is another way of saying retardando, which means slow down. So we get quieter and slow down. Page 28, we have our first major scale of the book. I would say get used to these because you're going to be practicing them a lot. An arpeggio refers to a chord that has been broken up. 
In this case, we have a D major chord that's been broken up, so it's a D major arpeggio. I've included a demonstration of all the variations of the scale. Feel free to skip them if you want, it's kind of a lot. safely graze is quite slow. So it's important to practice with the metronome to make sure that your rhythm is right and your subdivision is accurate. One thing that you can do is double the speed of your metronome and play along with the eighth notes if you're having a problem staying with the metronome. This one also includes a mode mixture, which is a fancy music theory term that implies that both A minor and A major are present in measure nine. The details of this are not super important right now, but what is important is to make sure that one, you play the C natural, and then the C sharp. Um, it's gonna sound a little strange to your ears probably, so it might be, not be a bad idea to practice this part with the tuner to make sure that you're getting it correct.
page 29, we're introduced to sixth position and the harmonics in sixth position, which means that now you've played on every position that this book has to offer. Sixth position is found above the fifth position. So if you remember, we find the fifth position, playing the D harmonic and putting our thumb there. Now if we put our third finger down again, we find the G harmonic, we put our thumb there. That's sixth position. In sixth position, we can play a bunch of harmonics because they're all super close together. On the G string, we have G, B, and D underneath our fingers, thumb, one, two. And then we have D, F sharp, A on the D string. And then we have A, C sharp, E on the A string. Because we can reach so many harmonics because they're so close together in this position, it's possible to play melodic lines with just using harmonics. Um, this is going to be a little tricky at first because the placement is not exactly intuitive. So I would recommend breaking these up into chunks and figuring out the finger placements where each one of these notes are. Did you ever see a Lassie's the fastest piece we've had to play so far? And it's also full of unequal bow distribution and retakes. So this is one that's going to be very important to practice slowly at first until you get the, all the movements down. Playing too fast too quickly is going to lead to sloppiness and tension in your right arm. We also have a retake in measure 12 that we haven't seen yet. So normally, up until this point, when we did a retake, it was a down bow retake to the frog in preparation for another down bow. In this instance, because of the unequal bow distribution, we do a down bow, we come back close to the frog, but we still play an up bow. So that's down bow, retake, up bow, down bow, two, up bow, down bow, two, up bow. Down bow, two, up bow. number two of the happy farmer is a hooked bowing exercise. A hooked bowing is when two notes are played with the same bow direction. So down, down, up, up. In this instance we have a dotted quarter note and then an eighth note. So count the eighth notes. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And we also have a little rest in between there so make sure that there's a space between the two notes in the same direction. So one, two, three, four. Happy Farmer, that hooked bowing is put to the test right away. So we have up, down, down, up, up. And then we have another quick shift into third position. This is a tough one because of all the string crossings. This is another one that is going to be very important to practice slowly. For example, measure five can end up quite sloppy if not practiced correctly.
This is a very famous bass solo. It's probably the orchestral solo that's played the most often. It comes from the beginning of the third movement of Mahler's first symphony. The bass starts off this giant round in the beginning of the movement with just a timpani accompanying it. And it keeps building and building and building throughout the movement. This movement is a funeral march. So your playing should be quite sad and solemn. It's marked solemn and measured in the beginning. Um, actually, this movement is more of a parody of the funeral march that becomes more and more obvious as the movement goes on. But in the beginning, it should be quite sad. This solo is in third position, but it's the first piece that we've played in a minor key. Here is D minor, and which means that we have F naturals instead of F sharps like we're used to, and we have B flats instead of B naturals like we've been used to. So instead of playing the third finger on both the strings, we're gonna, now we're going to play the second finger. So F natural is played with the second finger, and B flat is played with the second finger. I've provided an example of the trio at the bottom of this page to give you an idea of how the movement sounds. However, I would actually listen to the entire movement if you've never heard of it before. It's, it's a great piece of music. <laughs> bass player is another fast one that covers a bunch of the stuff that we've gone over already. Pay particular attention to the shift in measure six going from first position into second position. And then at the end of the piece shifting back from second position back into first position. seen in 6-8. Six 6-8 eight. Six means that there's six eighth notes per measure, and usually these eighth notes are divided into groups of three, which is a dotted quarter note. So there's six eighth notes, but we feel it in two big beats of three eighth notes.
the prep exercise for this one looks very similar to the Happy Farmer. It's uh, another hooked bowing, but here the rhythm is different because the time signature is different. So instead of having three eighth notes and then one eighth note, we have two eighth notes and then one eighth note. So when you're practicing it, make sure that your ratio is correct. So one, two, three, one, two, three, et cetera, et cetera. In measure four, we have a double up bow on B and D. This is another example of a hooked bowing. So essentially this is a slur with a little gap in the middle. In the same measure, we also have a pivot up to the harmonic G in third position. See if it's possible for you to reach that G with the third finger without taking your thumb off the heel of the neck. This will allow you to quickly get back to where you need to be. Be careful of the position shifting in this one. In the second to last line, we go from first position up to third position. And then on the last line, we go from third position to back down to second position. slow one make sure you work on it with the metronome also in measure five and all the measures like it you have to make sure that you spend enough bow on the first quarter note so that you have enough to hold it for two beats on the half note so we have another unequal bow distribution here i've changed the fingering slightly in measure eight and utilized what's called a fork fingering to make this crossing between the A harmonic and the D harmonic a little easier. All a fork fingering is, is when you play two notes across from each other with two different fingers instead of playing it with the same finger. So back here, it's not quite as common. But when you're playing in thumb position, it's very common because it's very difficult to bar across as you get higher and higher. So we actually play the perfect fourth with two different fingers. At the very end of the piece, we have our first artificial harmonic. An artificial harmonic is when you use more than one finger to stop the same string. And because it is stopped by the lower finger, we actually create a whole new set of harmonics that we can use with the upper finger. Um, this is a lot more common in the higher string instruments because it's a lot easier for them to reach bigger gaps but because our notes are so far apart, it's a little more difficult for us. But it does happen occasionally. So what we need to do for this one is find our D in fourth position, the D that we found several times now, that harmonic. And that gives us the note in the second last measure. And then we place our thumb on the string, touching the G harmonic. And then we get a D an octave higher. good job of summing up everything that we've learned so far. In the first measure, remember to pivot up to the G harmonic and then back down to the D. Uh, measure six and seven and the other measures that look like that are a little tricky at first. Um, this is probably something that you're going to want to practice slowly. 
Make sure you shift quickly from the third finger here to the third finger harmonic so that you don't get any squeaks with the bow. Same thing up here. In measure 12, we have another instance of fifth position. So in fourth position, we play G, B, thumb three. Then we shift our thumb up to that D, and then our third finger to the high G. And then you round out the book with another ah tempo, and you're done. Congratulations, you made it to the end of the first book. The second book will come out eventually. This was a lot of work. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.